Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Watson. I'm the Executive Director of Advancement here at St. Clements, and I'm really excited to be welcoming you all here with us tonight. Um, as a professional fundraiser for 25 years now, and a lifelong volunteer and donor, I'm excited about the conversations like the one we are just about to have. Hi, someone's just popped out of the curtains. Well played. Hi, welcome, Anne. <laughs> I'm just doing the introduction, you're all good. Um, philanthropy and the art of giving one's time, talents, wisdom, and money is a personal journey, particularly for women. At St. Clement's, we work daily to build upon the tradition of giving and caring that Canon Powell started so many years ago. And as we sit in Powell Hall, we're going to talk about the many ways women choose to give and the impact their generosity has on our social fabric. I feel that our panelists will share their experiences and wisdom with great authenticity and courage. And I just want to say a very personal thank you to each and every one of you for being here tonight with us. Um, I have one quick housekeeping note for those in the audience. We are recording for video and audio tonight. Hopefully that won't be a problem. Um, and so without further ado, I do want to introduce our moderator for tonight, Jill Nelson. She is an SCS alum and the woman that taught me everything I know about planned giving. Thank you for passing me. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun in Ottawa one year. Um, so Jill has specialized in gift planning for nearly 20 years, helping donors fulfill their deepest desires through philanthropy. She is passionate about the benefits of tax smart giving for donors to help them do more for society than they ever imagined. In her day job, she is Associate VP Gift Planning at the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation. Jill is a member of the National Board of the Canadian Association of Gift Planners and participates on several board and operational committees, as well as teaching courses on gift planning to fundraisers, like me, across the country. Jill received the Friend of CAGP Award in 2014 for her involvement and impact on strategic charitable gift planning in Canada. Thank you, and good luck, ladies. You say that as if they need luck. They do. <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here, and I, I hope you are pleased to be here, too. I think we're going to have a marvelous discussion. Uh, I've spoken to each of these women before, and they have great stories to tell. If you, uh, I should check, can you hear me at the back of the auditorium? Yeah, it's a very good sound system. Uh, I'm just going to say one word before we begin, and that is, what is philanthropy? People have different ideas of, of what that means. Um, one definition, that's a nice thing about Google these days, you can get 10 or 15 definitions at the stroke of a hand and pick the one you like, is goodwill to fellow members of the human race, especially the active effort to promote human welfare. So it doesn't say you have to be writing a check. It doesn't say you have to be volunteering, but that's usually what we understand by it. And uh, I think we're going to learn a lot about these perspectives as we speak with these panelists today. I will start at the far end. Um, Anne Magisano is a class of 94 grad from St. Clements. Uh, Anne joined Burgundy Asset Management in 2008 to gain the knowledge and skills required to be competent and confident in matters related to investing. Today, she works closely with individuals and families to educate and build their confidence in investing. In order to build a community that inspires women to make investing a priority, she launched The Women of Burgundy. It has grown to 780 members in five years. And also currently sits on the board of directors at Crow's Theatre, the Canadian Opera Company, and the Toronto Public Library Foundation, where she is treasurer and chair, finance and audit committee. Welcome, Anne. Mm -hmm. Next to Anne is a woman I've had the pleasure of working beside for many, many years, Joanne Ryan. Joanne is Vice President, Philanthropic Advisory Services at TD Wealth, and Executive Director and Architect of the Private Giving Foundation. PGF was the first donor-advised fund program launched by a financial institution in Canada that provides a structure to leave a lasting legacy in a simple and effective manner. And in this way, she has been 
a pioneer in this country and, and hugely successful with all the major financial institutions following suit. Joanne developed strategies within TD Wealth that help clients incorporate philanthropy in their overall financial and estate plans. She's a past member of the executive of the Greater Toronto Area Canadian Association of Gift Planners and is currently a member of the Government Relations Committee, which lobbies the Department of Finance to improve tax incentives related to charitable giving, which is all very exciting to me, but maybe not to everyone. <laughs> Uh, tax matters, you know. <laughs> Joanne is also a member of the Estate Planning Council of Toronto. She's an active volunteer on several gift planning committees for charities. In 2002, she was one of the first people in Canada to receive the Friend of CAGP Award for her significant contribution to gift planning in Canada. She's a member of the advisory board of the only Masters in Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership Program at Carleton University and is vice chair of the board for Bishops University. So, welcome, Joanne. If anybody here doesn't know Wendy Gervin, don't put up your hand. For 32 years, Wendy held a number of different roles at St. Clement's School, including teaching physical science ed education, sorry, phys ed, coaching, being a mentor, athletic director, and fundraising for the Bigger Blazer campaign, director of student life, and working in the advancement office. She loved every minute of her time at St. Clement's. And she says philanthropy is an important part of her life, so she continues to remain involved in her community, supporting a number of charities that provide opportunities for girls and young women, and organizations that, that provide educational opportunities for people of all ages. Wendy also volunteered with YMCA Geneva Park, was on the board at Camp Kirk for 20 years, and is the incoming vice president of the board at the Ladies Golf Club of Toronto. Thank you for coming back, Wendy. <laughs> Julie Lasson is a member of the class of 90 from St. Clements, and she is the director of the, she is the director or a director of the Lasson family, a director of the Lasson Family Foundation. She's a member of the Board of Governors of York University, a member of the Board of Governors of the Royal Ontario Museum, and a member of the Board of Governors of the National Gallery of Canada Foundation. She has accumulated more than 20 years experience in the banking and mining industries, and over the last 10 years, she's acted as an executive or director for eight junior mining companies, including leadership roles as president and CEO. Thank you for joining us tonight, Julie. <laughs> So I'm going to start with um, a question for Joanne, because TD has done some tremendous work researching the impact of women in philanthropy and, and what their role is. And, and Joanne, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the research, and primarily first, why it was important for TD to take this on. Thanks, Jill. Um, pleasure to be here. So actually, way back, we, um, we held some focus groups uh, as part of our women investors strategy to see how well we were at advising women on invest uh, investments. And we actually hired Boston Consultant. And the news that came back was that women looked at their financial advisors similar to buying a car. It wasn't a pleasant experience. And we knew we weren't doing a great job because women's life expectancy is greater than men. And after the man would die, within a year, uh, all of the investments of the woman would leave. So we started to invest a lot of time um, training our advisors on how, on how to deal with women. Women uh, crave a different experience than men. They ask more questions. They do more due diligence on an investment. And we kind of made a lot of progress in that area. And then I think it was 2014, we said, OK, um, we know women make investment decisions differently than men. They probably make philanthropic decisions differently than men. There, were, there was research on women and philanthropy, but it was either from the UK or the US or Australia, and there was nothing Canadian-based. And so we thought, let's, let's do some research. So we partnered with a company called Investor Economics. Uh, they did quantitative and qualitative 
qualitative research. So we actually held focus groups with women philanthropists in all of the major, uh, the major cities in Toronto. Uh, in, in, in the country, sorry, including Toronto. And, uh, and then we've published a couple of reports, but the idea was um, to share it. And so we've been having these type, uh, types of panel discussions with charities across the country. So why is it important? Uh, women are gaining in wealth. Uh, so in 2016, women controlled uh, 1. Uh, 1.6 trillion, which is going to jump to about 3.6 trillion in 2026. So in, in 2016, women controlled about 35% of the wealth in Canada, which will jump to 50% in 2026. Uh, women's life expectancy is greater than men, uh, so they often end up inheriting twice from a parent and then again from a partner or a spouse. Women are gaining in entre entrepreneurship. Uh, we still have work to do to close the wage gap, but uh, we're working hard on it. So, so it's women are ultimately ending up with the majority of the money. They actually care. And, and so uh, it's important for charities to understand uh, how to approach and cultivate women as donors and um, how to get them engaged. And so that's really you know, what started the research report. Great. So we know that it identified that business has changed. How do you see this playing out uh, in philanthropy for women? How is this having an impact? What's changing in philanthropy for women? Yeah. Well, um, women, uh, women. Uh, a couple of things came from our research. Um, they do give differently than men. Uh, one of the things women c really care about with an organization is the relationship that they have with the organization. So they want a relationship with the volunteers, with the staff, with the board members. Men will sometimes write a check quicker and not really bothering to you know build those longer term relationships. So. If you're going to attract a woman donor, then you're going to have to, you know, have events or sim similar things that that will cultivate those uh, relationships. Um, lo you know, women again, they'll do that due diligence. Uh, they'll often volunteer uh, for an organization to get to know them better before making uh, a major gift. Uh, women like uh, collaboration. So what came out of the report was that, well, there's 86,000 charities in Canada. They're all calling, asking you for your money, and usually at dinner. And, um, <laughs> and, and so in the way our system works is any organization can go apply to get a charitable status with Canada Revenue Agency. And Canada Revenue Agency isn't going to say, well, did you know there's 20 organizations that are doing exactly the same thing? Why don't you consider you know, joining forces instead of yet starting another new charitable organization? So women don't like charities competing against each other, which often we do have uh, when there's different campaigns. So some women in the, in the focus groups actually said they actually decided they, that if, if organization A worked on a project with organization B, that one plus one would equal three. And they actually used their money and their power to kind of force them to work together in order to, to do a better project than if they were just doing it um, individually. Um, and, and women, you know, women volunteer. It's kind of in our DNA, and um, and there's a huge, there's also a huge potential uh, to engage more women, uh, to get more women on boards and in leadership positions within the sector. Also, super. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so let's see how this plays out because I think it really is in the DNA. We're going to find. Um, so starting with you, Julie, what? What led you to become involved in philanthropy in the way that you have? Um, well, I, so I think it would, I, I would have to say initially it was organic. It was something that um, I learned from both my, my mom and dad. And um, growing up, um, there was always, um, I, and certainly because I came to St. Clements in grade seven, I remember having the um, Daily Bread food bank um, big box that you would donate, you know, your craft dinner. There was no organic stuff back then, no <laughs> Annie's or anything like that. And uh, canned goods, and I remember that, you know, my mom was like, you must bring stuff to donate, and it's very important. And then, um, obviously, um, 
my, my, my parents did very, very well. And so at some point, um, my mother, uh, who passed away in 2000, um, n n knew sh she was ill, and she wanted to leave a legacy. And so for her, she said, okay, well, I'm going to start this foundation before I pass away, and I want, you know, and speaking to me and my brother, I want you both to be directors and part of the foundation, and I want you to think about how you're going to donate, you know, this money that I'm leaving into the foundation. And at the time, it was a, you know, I'm going to say a modest amount. It is not a modest amount anymore. And so, um, but one of the things that, and, and there's been a very organic growth and, and largely the, the funds are directed by my father. But that being said, we have as a family um, begun a real sort of concerted effort as to how we're going to do it. And one of the things that our foundation has very clearly outlined um, is that we don't just give um, of our, our funds, we give of our time. So every family, every foundation or every organization that we have donated to has a family member involved. And so, for example, you know, we've given to the ROM, we've given to the National Gallery of Canada, and we've certainly given it um, to York University. Um, my brother is on the board of the Toronto French School where his kids go, and we've given there. And he's also um, on the board of Sick Kids Foundation. And, and you know the families donated there, and so there's a, a variety of different um, organizations, but each one has one of us um, involved in some way, shape, or form. So I don't know if that answers the question. It's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and maybe I'll jump over to Anne now. Uh, how did you get involved in philanthropy? Uh, first of all, I would like to beg everyone's forgiveness for being late, um, but I will say I was living the value of philanthropy. I just came from a board meeting for Toronto Public Library Foundation, and um, as chair of FNA, it's important that I be there. So <laughs> thank you for, for your patience. And, and uh, So how did I get involved in philanthropy? Well, it was certainly part of the, the culture of my family growing up, um, much more on my mom's side. She was very involved uh, with the St. George's Society, which was a way for her to connect with her British roots. Um, my dad's Italian, and sort of the Italian side of the family was very dominant uh, and, and very present within my, my home life, and my mom reached out to this organization to, to, to just be amongst, amongst her roots and, and to connect with her history. And as she took on more and more leadership position with that organization, she would recruit me to help. And so inevitably, um, when she was going there to, to be at an event, I was sort of her date and, and working alongside her. Um, I would say my awareness of philanthropy was brought to, the, to another level when I joined Burgundy Asset Management. Uh, we have a, a culture there of leadership in philanthropy. Uh, it's really driven by Tony Errol, who's our founder, and Richard Rooney, who's our chief investment officer. And uh, contrary to what you were saying, Joanne, these are two men who did more than just write checks. And that was re really, really eye-opening and impressive for me because they could just write a check. Um, but what they showed me, and um, they also invited me into their engagement with the community, is that it was much more important to do more than just write a check, to give their time and their energy and their ideas. And I was um, just so impressed with that because you can imagine the, the leadership of a company would have so many different competing demands uh, for their time. Uh, and so that culture has really helped nur nurture me and nurture my uh, philosophy around philanthropy. Fantastic. Wendy. Um, similar kinds of things to Anne and, um, and Julie. Um, I grew up in a family where my grandfather was a volunteer for the Canadian YMCA on a national level, uh, worked very hard in the insurance business, didn't have a lot of money, but felt it was very important to be giving back his time. Um, we were part of YMCA Geneva Park, which is a conference center uh, part of the Y uh, north of Toronto. Um, my father worked for the YMCA full time. He was overseas with YMCA services during the war and then came back and worked for um, YMCA camps until he had four kids and realized he couldn't put them through university on a YMCA mm -hmm. salary. So he got a different job, but continued to volunteer on the National Council of the YMCA. Um, so again, an example of two guys giving back, um, not in a monetary way, but 
but certainly in a, in a giving way, a volunteer way, which was neat for me to see. And my mother, actually, when we lived in Toronto when I was young, was um, chair of the International Foreign Student Society at University of Toronto. And again, it wasn't giving any money back to that, but we had foreign students in our house all the time. She was on the front page of the Toronto Star um, for hosting um, some uh, Indian, um, West and East Indian um, people from that were students at U of T, uh, older people that were adults that were coming to school there. So that's kind of how I grew up, seeing those kinds of things happening in my home. And then uh, once I went to university and came back to Toronto in 1981, I started working with the um, YMCA Geneva Park on a cottager's um, uh, committee and then ended up being on the Camp Kirk board. So I think my passion is, is giving time, um, especially to organizations uh, that I really believe in what they're what they're doing and the good that they're doing for for people and helping people. So that's kind of my story and how I got involved um, with those things. Neat. Thank you. Wendy, don't put it down yet. <laughs> I'm curious about how you choose the charities you support. Uh, it, it's interesting because time, I mean, as I said, it's something I've got, I'm passionate about. Um, I do give monetarily to some organizations. Um, I now spend February in, um, in Mexico, and so um, there's an organization, a Canadian organization, that supports um, the city that we go to in Mexico, uh, 12 different charities there. So it's something that I've, I've gone out in the community with their, uh, they have a dental medical van that um, goes out into the community and services. Um, hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, small little villages that can't get to a big city to, to get those kinds of things. So I think seeing um, the good um, will encourage me to then support them financially. Um, the Camp Kirk that I've been on was on the board for 20 years. I would go every summer for a few days and actually experience it and see how it's helping these kids with um, special needs. And so again, seeing where you know my time and my money was going, um, I think was hugely supportive. So um, I also have a lot of friends that support different charities. So I tend to, when asked by them um, and something that they're passionate about, um, we'll do that. We obviously all get phone calls all the time over the phone asking us to support things, but I like it to be something that I'm personally connected to. Right, yeah, those phone calls and the ones about getting your ducks cleaned. Yeah, yeah, ducks cleaned. Yes. <laughs> I'm, curi I'm curious personally whether anybody has ever actually said, yes, I'd like you to come to my house sight unseen and clean my ducks, but I don't think that's really what they're doing. <laughs> And how about you? You're involved in a number of charities. How do you support, how do you choose which ones to support? Uh, for me, it, it comes down to uh, my values. And uh, I, um, I'm i in the investment industry now, but I, ha I actually have a degree in art history and film studies. And uh, I'm on the board of the Canadian Opera Company and Crows Theatre. Um, and those are two arts organizations. And I, and I joined the, those organizations because uh, initially, I, I wanted to stay connected to the arts. It's such a meaningful part of my life, and just because I have a degree and I'm now in the investment business, I didn't want to let that go. So I wanted a way to stay connected. Uh, and I firmly believe uh, that the arts are vital to thriving communities and that they attract top talent to our community. And um, financially, I support them because I want to make sure that they continue to thrive in the future. Uh, Toronto Public Library Foundation, it, it's uh, the library, you know, it's, a, it's sort of the ultimate ideal for democracy and sort of supports, uh, supports basic human rights and the idea that education should be available to all. And so that um, is certainly something that I also believe in. And so it does come down to belief and value for me. Yeah, so participating. And, and Julie, you said this earlier that uh, for your family foundation, the main organizations you support, the f a family member is involved. Um, is there, is it driven largely by what people want to support or is there a strategy behind that? How does that work? Is there a strategy? <laughs> I'm a fundraiser, <laughs> I wanna know how to. <laughs> um, uh, so, so again, as I said, my, um, it's not a linear sort of path in what I would say, and, and most of the, the other family foundations, and you know, I've become connected to quite a few different members of different family foundations, and it's not a linear path. I mean, it's sort of like this spaghetti thing of how people choose and how they get involved and where they get involved. 
for for me specifically, and actually I would say for my brother and I and my father, it's a combination of obviously my father does most of the directing of the fa of the funds, so it has to be something that he sees value in. Um, but fortunately, m before my mom passed away, she actually set up three pillars for the foundation. So it had to be the arts, the community in which we live, and education. And so as long as it falls within, so hospitals are right out for the most part. Um, and um, I'm trying to think of what the other thing, but the hospitals, when they call, we're like, mm, no, not for us. Um, and the other thing is, honestly, it's the people. It's the people who are within that organization, and if we connect with them, if we feel that um, it, it, it becomes a far more technical and uh, business decision, if you will, because you know the amount of funds that we're giving, we want to ensure that they're being uh, properly used, well managed, and at the end of the day, that's part of the reason that one of us always has to be involved, whether it's on a board, you know, on a, in a board uh, position or actually just um, in any other sort of capacity where we're involved and we can see how those funds are being used. I mean, we, of course, all of these, the, um, the organizations we give to give us an annual sort of report to let us know how the funds have been used. Um, but I think that um, we find it personally, I know my brother and I do, find it personally very rewarding to be involved as well um, and to see the good that the money that our foundation has given and what it's doing. So that's sort of, it's less obvious, but. Yeah, no, that's. Really interesting. Pity about the hospitals, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trust me, you're not the all. first to say that. <laughs> and Joanne, how does this fit with the research that you've done, with the kinds of things you're hearing here? Um, I, I would say that uh, a lot of thought goes into women's philanthropy, which, which fits within the research. Um, we encourage clients to do a philanthropic plan that reflects their values. So uh, what we don't like to see at tax time is people coming in with a shoebox of all kinds of different receipts because they're being hit on. Uh, left, right, and center, and they're just reacting, as opposed to going through a process and identifying the values that are important to you, the causes that are important to you, um, and, and putting a philanthropic plan together. And if you do a plan, um, A, you can have greater impact, and, and B, then it actually becomes easier to say no when an ask comes in that may be a very good cause, but it doesn't fit in with the values that you've said are important um, are important to you. Uh, the, the research uh, talked about how women often volunteer, uh, which you know we've heard loud and clear from the women on this panel how important it is uh, for women to to volunteer and to get engaged with charities uh, that they're making a major gift, so they get to know them. So it, it sounds like the research is very much in line with what we've heard here. Yeah, it really does, and it sounds like. Each of you, I mean, this has been a huge part of your life. This has actually been uh, transformational for you. Um, and Wendy, it struck me when you told your story about Geneva Park and the YMCA that maybe this even drove you into the career you finally chose, that sense of community and making lives yeah, better. Yeah, probably, because I was, Geneva Park is a YMCA camp. And so, you know, you're there, you've got counselors, you've got things happening all the time, um, sporty things happening, we're participating in different things, and uh, it was a very active place, and I think that then encouraged me to get involved in athletics and then going to university, um, thinking I was going to be a math teacher, but most of the people on the volleyball team I was playing on were on the, in the phys ed program, and they were having a whole lot more fun than I was, so <laughs> I changed directions quite quickly, but um, I then taught swimming during my university years and ended up um, you know, coming to St. Clements and really never left. And to our great benefit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Anne, your volunteerism led to your career mm -hmm. the, through this, this, you know, through the St. George's Society, I think. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how that yeah, came this along? Yeah, this is sort of a great story because... Um, uh, as I said, I, had a, I have a degree in art and film, and prior to that, I have a degree in sciences. So I never really planned to go into investing or, or really even understood what 
uh, investing was all about or, or, or asset management. Um, anyway, in the, in the process of working with my mom uh, at the St. George's Society, she, would, she was the chair of this gala every year. And every year, they would honor someone in the city uh, for their contributions to the community. And I would do this probably year after year. And uh, there was one year in particular where they decided to honor Tony Errol, who was the, who was the founder of Burgundy. And in the process of getting to know Burgundy and getting to know Tony and trying to figure out why are they honoring Tony and who is this person and what does Burgundy do, I started to read sort of more on their website and started to understand um, uh, more about the philosophy of investing. And it, it led me to, to read more about Warren Buffett, which is the style of investing that we practice. And by the end of the year in which I was preparing for that uh, event, I had decided that this was something that I needed to learn, and, and I was going to spend the next couple of years of my life learning about value investing, and, and because this was this was important for me to to be able to manage my own money, and it was it was a, for me it was the most critical thing at that time, and so the day of the gala. Um, Tony arrived, and I had never met him before, and I went up to him, and I said, you know, Tony, I just want to let you know that I've decided to change my career path because of you, <laughs> and uh, I would love to work for you one day. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he asked for my background. I told him I had a degree in art and film and sciences, and he said, you know, I'm not sure we have anything for you. <laughs> um, you know, a very rational response, of course. Um, I knew I knew that I had to show some credibility, and I was serious, so I started to take night courses and 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 started to. I got another job, um, but I always knew Burgundy was there, and I always sort of had that as my dream uh, opportunity because I knew if I could surround myself with investors at Burgundy, that I would just at least learn by osmosis. The way of thinking, and that and that would set me up for life for good. Um, and here I am, eleven years later. So, Great. yeah. So it's a story of how getting involved in the community can really open your eyes to to a bigger world than you have access to, or that your parents could ever uh, expose you to. And so, in many ways, being involved in the community has brought so much richness to my life. Uh, yeah, that's that's a wonderful story. Um, and Julie, you mentioned that your family's foundation has evolved over the years. It's, it's interesting. You know, it started with your mother's idea, and she said, you guys are going to carry this on, and now you're carrying it on to the next generation. So how has this evolved, and, and what are you seeing the benefits of involving the family? Um, well, yeah, so um, like I said, it's, it wasn't a, it's not a linear path, and... I would say we've come a long way in the last five or six years. Um, one thing I did was I took a course at the University of Toronto, and I, I want to call it wealth management, but I, honestly, I can't remember. It was, it was four days long, and I walked away um, realizing that I needed to think about how I was going to teach my kids about philanthropy and how I wanted them to approach it and and I, I wanted to give them structure I didn't want to to um, barricade them though I, I did want to give them some structure around how they should think about philanthropy and um, what motivates them and what kind of things that they would like to support and given the fact that they were going to be eventually part of the the family foundation and the directions of the funds from this foundation that they would know that there were these three pillars that their grandmother had put into place um, and so I started and I, I got very lucky I, f I found this um, um, website actually that was set up by the Bronfmans, uh, the Bronfman family called 2164, and they call and 21 is when they think you should start giving, um, and then 64 is when they think people are thinking about passing it down to the next generation, the, the mantle down to the next generation. Um, and so I got the motivational value cards, and I said, okay, we're going to play a game. And so I sat down with the kids, and I see each one. You have to pick your, and Lauren was, Lauren was five years old, so we had to read the words out for her, which was really sweet. But everybody had to pick their top five. And what was amazing is that amongst the five of us, we were all 
we, we had three in common uh, right across the board. And so that started the discussion of, okay, so we all feel, you know, compassion was one of them. I think integrity was another one. And I'm, I can't think of the third one. But that sparked the conversation. And then what we said was, okay, and we have a surprise for you, which is you are gonna have an allocation and you get to direct this number, this amount of money to um, a foundation, a choice, an organization of your choice. And the three kids were like, oh, okay, well, hang on a sec. I don't know, like, can I spread it around? Does it have to go to one place? This is a lot of money. I could buy a lot of American girls with this. I was like, <laughs> yes. Okay, well, let's focus on the philanthropy. But it actually worked out really, really well. And, um, you know, so uh, Chloe this year, the full amount is going to the grad gift. Ms. Perry, Whoa. just wanted to let you know. I yes. A round of applause so she that. was, uh, she was, that was a like hands down, no questions asked. I don't even want to, and, and it was funny because normally we have discussions around why they chose and, and you know, their, their purpose behind it. And Chloe is like, we can discuss, but this is where the money's going. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I like that. True, yes. true career at Clementine. Yeah, Clementine through and through. Um, and, uh, and Lauren um, is very thoughtful, and she likes to give to the Children's Book Bank because she thinks everybody should have access to books because she, she has loved reading ever since she could. Um, so that, oh, that's pretty awesome. And then uh, Jake has supported a variety of different um, organizations. One of them was actually the Wernham West um, Center uh, within UCC because they helped him a great deal. He had a learning disability and um, he felt strongly and, and this, the center was amazing for him. Um, and then most recently he's been supporting his college in Maine. So we understand that. Um, and so that's sort of how we, we've sort of gone around. It's still organic. We're still working through it. But I think that uh, that's how the fam our, our family is, is uh, helping the kids understand their, their next steps. Yeah, and evolving as the world changes and the kids change and responding to their, their interests. That really is values in action. Mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing. Um, and Anne, you started the Women of Burgundy. Uh, tell us about the genesis of that and what you see it doing for the women who belong to that. Uh, well, Women of Burgundy was launched five years ago, and it was launched directly in response to one of my clients. Um, she had been coming uh, with her husband uh, to meet with me for a few years, and prior to me being their advisor, she had had another advisor at Burgundy, so she'd been a client of the firm for a very long time. Anyway, uh, she called me up one day, and she asked to come and meet with me, and uh, there was a sense of urgency in her voice, which is quite rare uh, because we don't trade daily at Burgundy and so sort of it's very rare that anything would be so urgent uh, that they would need to see me in one day. Anyway, I said, yes, of course, please come down. She came down to our office. We're in, in Brookfield Place. We're on the 45th floor. And there she was in the lobby and uh, I went up to her and her hands were shaking and she's like, this is the first time I've been here by myself. And I brought her into the boardroom and she sat me down and I'll never forget this moment. Um, she said to me, Anne, I don't know, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, I want you to know, in all the time that you've been taking care of me, I haven't understood a word that you have said. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an emotional moment for me because it's, it sort of really made me understand that I was not doing my job. You know, I was taking care of 50% of that relationship and completely ignoring this woman and ignoring her needs as it relates to her portfolio. Anyway, I took that story back to my peers and I told them uh, what had happened. Uh, and the other thing she said to me, she said, Anne, I know I have to change. I know I need to learn about investing because uh, my friend has just lost her husband like you were saying, Joanne, and she is for the first time trying to learn about her money, and I don't want to be in that position. If something happens to my husband, I want to be able to take care of myself. Anyway, it's sort of one of those moments that changes your life forever, so we went, I went back to my peers, I told them the story. We knew we had to do something to help our women become more comfortable and confident around their money. Uh, we launched Women of Burgundy. We didn't know what it was going to be. We didn't know it was going to grow to this big, but um, uh, we launched with me giving a speech around uh, what it would be. 
uh, I announced a mission statement that it would be sort of an educational series where we would educate our women around uh, their investments and we would build a community of women to support them. And the response from my speech uh, in April of 2014 was, was tremendously supportive. And we started a book club, and we started a keynote speaker series, and we started a seminar series. Um, in our keynote speaker series, we bring in uh, investment and business luminaries who are women. So we've had Katie Taylor, who's the chair of the Royal Bank of Canada, Linda Hassenfratz, the CEO of Linam Linamar, for example. Um, Two weeks ago, we had Zita Cobb, the founder of Fogo Island Inn. Um, we have a book club. So yesterday, we had a book club, and we read Bad Blood. I don't know if you've read that book by John Carreau. It's the story of Theranos. Um, anyway, so we've been doing these events. And, and now, as you said, five years later, we've impacted 780 women. And uh, it's, it's been an extraordinary experience. That's wonderful. And it doesn't sound like it's about philanthropy, but uh, I think it was you who told me on the phone that you can't give unless you have a good, strong idea of what your uh, comfort level is. Um, can you expand on that a little? Absolutely. Um, you know, sort of our sense of safety in the world, is my belief, is, is partly determined by our ability to be financially empowered. And that story that I told you about this woman who was terrified at the thought of having to take care of ourselves financially and not having the tools and the resources to do that. It gives you a sense of how much fear uh, was in her mind uh, and in her friend's mind who was going through it at the time. And so I really believe that financial empowerment and confidence around your money can, if you have that and if you sort of build the skills and the resources to achieve that, it gives you a sense of safety in the world. And you can't give to philanthropy and you can't give to others until you know that you can take care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? And so oftentimes clients will come to me and they'll sort of, they'll, they'll throw out an idea. They'll say, I, I would really love to give to this, this charity. It means so much to me. And my responsibility at that time is to sort of say, okay, let's work back and let's see, is that feasible? within all of the other goals and objectives that this money needs to serve. Your ability to pay your bills, to take care of yourself, to help your children if that's important to you. And so it's sort of um, uh, a setting of expectations around what is the level of capital that you have, what is a, a reasonable amount uh, within the context of your goals for your money that you can withdraw. Is that financial goal or desire attainable uh, in many cases it is, and sort of that's sort of a sense of, of freedom is sort of I never realized that I could give this much money to this charity, and sort of it's sort of a very positive thing, yeah. um, you know, and sort of, off, and then the other, the other, sometimes it doesn't work out, and then, you know, you have to sort of remember that philanthropy is not just about giving money, and in fact, sometimes giving your time, your time is more valuable than your money. Uh, and giving your energy and your ideas from your experience and your life experience, that is so valuable too. So it's not just about being able to write that check. Connections and all. And, and Joanne, I know you can't speak for all the banks, uh, but you certainly um, have brought TD to the forefront as well in helping people make financial plans. How do, how do advisors help their clients? So we spend a lot of t I spend a lot of time with our financial advisors, training them um, on how to have a conversation with their client around philanthropy, how to find out what their values are, what their goals are, uh, to educate them on the tax benefits around giving. The tax is not the number one motivator why people give. But we do have very general t generous tax incentives in Canada compared to other countries when it comes to giving. And um, you know, this isn't going to be a tax seminar, but you almost get half of it back when you make a donation in the form of a tax credit. So you make a $10,000 donation, you get $5,000 back. And if you have invested well and you have capital gains or appreciated securities and you donate those stock, you'll still get that you know, donation receipt for the market value, giving half of it back, uh, but you also eliminate the capital gains tax. So you can really drive the cost of making um, the gift down quite low. So we train advisors on the tax benefits. We train advisors on all the different vehicles that are out there for giving. You can give directly. You can use insurance. You can use a donor-advised fund. You can set up your own foundation. You can do a bequest in your will. 
the the list is quite extensive, and um, so so we are you know we are uh, having those conversations. Um, philanthropy when I started at TD in 2003 was this fluffy thing on the side. It wasn't our core business. Our core business was banking and investment management. Today, nobody would argue uh, with me about the importance of philanthropy for our high net worth clients. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, uh, back to Warren Buffett, uh, when we do estate plans with clients, 20 years ago, they may have said everything to my kids. Now the first thing out of their mouth is my kids are not getting it all. It's just too much. You know, the Warren Buffett phrase, you want to leave them enough to do anything but not too much to do nothing. Um, or some of our clients start to brag about how successful their kids are and they don't, they don't need the money or they, they don't have children and so philanthropy almost becomes that child in, in terms of, of their planning. So we do incorporate it in the, in the financial and estate plans. Uh, for our clients. Uh, the makeup of the high net worth client has also changed. Um, 20 years ago, it might have been mostly family money or inherited money. Um, and today in Canada, two-thirds of our high net worth clients are self-made. So what does that mean when it comes to philanthropy? Well, if you inherit it, you, you can still be generous, but you also view your role as a steward or custodian of those assets to pass on to the next generation. If you've made it yourself, like two-thirds, it's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. You've, and if you've started with very little, um, you've seen volatility in your net worth. So taking a chunk of money and giving it away isn't that scary. And um, and also, um, you know, if you've sold a business, these types, these people are actually very, very grateful to the community that helped support their business to build it. Uh, so often. It, it, it's in their DNA to give back to the community that they are actually really grateful. So um, we're working towards getting more and more um, financial advisors comfortable having the, the philanthropic uh, conversation with their clients. Um, it's one of our four pillars now at TD. Mm -hmm. So in, pri in private wealth management, we have four pillars. Build net worth, protect what matters, implement tax efficient strategies, and leave a legacy. And for many, that legacy is that charitable legacy. So it it, it has to be part of the conversation that uh, that advisor is having with their client. That's fabulous. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time because we want to give the audience a chance to ask questions as well, um, which is kind of too bad because I've got some other questions I'd like to ask. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to ask each of you to maybe just say what you know. Anything you'd like to say to the audience um, before we go to their questions. Just anything that's been left unsaid, or that you'd like to emphasize, or whatever else. Um, so you can think about that. Except for Wendy, because Wendy, I'm going to ask you. Um, you've done an awful lot to encourage the students here to be philanthropic and to encourage people to think about how they can support. St. Clements, and I know that when you retired, there was a wonderful award in your name. Um, can you tell us a bit about why you feel it's important to encourage the students to become philanthropic and um, what you've done in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think um, St. Clements has always been encouraging of of students to fundraise. We've had, you know, in the past, bake sales and all kinds of um, the prefects or the student leadership groups would have a charity, the clubs would have charities. Um, I think it was about eight years ago when we started the, um, what we called at that point, I think it's changed names, the Community Service Day. And as Director of Student Life, I kind of oversaw the logistics of that the first couple of, um, of years. But what that was, was on a day um, kind of right after exams before Christmas, we sent the entire higher school out of the building um, to something. And, you know, we had, I think the first year, 29 different organizations that we researched that we um, were able to support. The kids signed up. We ended up having a computer program for how we sent them. And it was so rewarding to see those people coming back and the kids coming back because it wasn't just, you know, put a toonie in here and get a donut. It was, you know, actually experiencing the, um, the volunteerism. And uh, remember, 
remember there were one of the organizations we sent them to was Meals on Wheels. And it was only about six kids, and we had parents driving them. And those kids came back and came into my office after that first time, and some of them were in tears and just said, I will never forget that experience. Um, to knock on a door and meet somebody that didn't have enough food to eat, um, that uh, you know appreciated so much what we took them. And, uh, and I know some of those ones that had that experience will do that later in life. And those are the kind of experiences that when we first started the round square trips, um, you know, 20 years ago, I remember one of the students, first students that went on the Dominican trip years and years ago, came back and we were so excited to have set them down. That was a service trip. They were in, you know, a town building a, a school or a foundation for a school or something. And she came back and everybody was so excited, you know, how did it go? And she came into my office and just burst into tears and said, I can't explain it. Like, I can't tell you right now. I can't. Everybody keeps asking, and even my family, but the impact it had on me to be, you know, sleeping on cement slabs and eating beans and rice all day, every day, and experiencing and meeting these children that were so joyful and, you know, with what they had, which was really nothing. Um, and so seeing those kinds of experiences um, is has just been amazing. I think St. Clements does a great job in providing that because, as I think we've all said, the, the money is one part of all of this, but the other part is the passion and the seeing what your work is doing. And um, so, you know, overseeing those, you know, those kinds of things when I was in my role at St. Clement's was, you know, one of the, the most um, rewarding parts of my job. And certainly I didn't start it. I just kind of was in charge of the logistics for those things. And um, But I did have a lot of contact with the students and heard a lot of the stories afterwards. So I think that's where I encourage parents um, to be giving their children those experiences of actually getting into the community and seeing what the money does and what we're doing with the Moose Factory um, uh, kids and that relationship that's been built over the last 10 years is just spectacular. Um, because again, those it changes lives. The, the girl that I was was talking about came back and said uh, I thought I was going to go to this university and I'm now going into international development you know after two weeks in the Dominican it kind of changed the direction of her life so um, the experiential part so when the school when Janet McKinnon and I retired the school established the experiential award in our name and we still interview the students every year who um, apply for that award and it's usually a student that wouldn't be able to go on that trip otherwise and uh, they make their case on why they should be chosen and then they usually write a letter to us afterwards saying how meaningful it was so that was a very special part of of retiring <laughs> <laughs> so sort the legacy of retiring kind of, yeah, yeah. Sort, of, sort of retiring <laughs> <laughs> i think you have also given everyone a taste of what saint clement's girls are known for the yeah. passion courage and curiosity that yeah that's that's really wonderful so I'll give each of you, you know, a little time to sum up if you'd like. Could we start with you, Julie? Yeah, sure. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, before we, we, you know, we we came and, and uh, sat here on this panel, I I took the time to reflect on on St. Clements, and um, you know, I was a student here from grade seven to grade twelve, and my daughter will have been a career Clementine, and I think one of the things that St. Clements is learning to do better, but I think has a long way to go still, is to encourage our future alumni um, to give back to its school. It's, um, it, it, it is so important. Um, these girls are so smart and they are, they, they do have this amazing amount of compassion. They love the community in which they have grown, um, grown up in. And to remind them, I love the grad gift. I think it's an awesome idea. But then I, I you know, I look at my son um, and the schools he's gone to, and good grief, do they ever know how to reach out to him, no matter where he is, to get, you know? And they don't care. It's a, is it a ten dollar gift, a twenty five dollar gift, a hundred dollar gift? But if we start right off in first year university, reminding them that they are where they are today because they got this incredible school that put them on, that gave them the right foundation for the rest of their lives. And so I know I don't have to worry about Chloe. She's got that. She, <laughs> she's clear. <laughs> but I, I hope that um, 
I wish she had been here tonight, but I really hope that her classmates, and I think her, you know, she has a great class, and I think her classmates do understand that, but to inculcate that in all the grades, and so that at some point it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, um, that the girls always know when they leave that there will always be in the back of their mind, well, yes, but I will give back every year, and I will give back even if it starts with a small sum, you know, it, that it will grow, um, because uh, we, we need that. St. Clements needs that. And um, for women to become more empowered, for uh, I'm a big advocate of women in STEM, and for more women to be in STEM, we need women to start at schools like St. Clements. That's Thank my you. thought. Thank you. Great thought. Wendy? Uh, I, I was going to say very similar to what Julie said. In, in 2004, um, I was asked to um, take part in the Bigger Blazer campaign, which was raising money for this part of this build, this part of the building, and the um, the wooden gym floor, um, wooden gym. <laughs> and uh, my my role was to contact past parents uh, because I had already been at the school for 25 years and I knew most of the parents. And so I had never done any fundraising. I had never done any asking for money. I had volunteered and I had given some donations, but I had never really asked before. For. And it was a fascinating experience um, to call up people that I hadn't seen, some of them in 20 years, and say, we're doing this for St. Clement's. Um, you know, your daughter benefited. Would you be willing to give? And it was, it was really interesting um, to see the responses. And most of the parents gave. Um, and most of the parents said, you know, exactly what Julie just said, is that my kid would not be where she is right now without St. Clement's. Um, but we, I had a few of them say, you know, that's fine, I'll give but you should be asking my daughter. You know, she's now 30, she's now graduated, she's on her way, um, she's, you know, got her own kids, and so she's starting to think about that. And so, um, I, again, I think the culture of philanthropy and giving back, it's really important to look here um, and uh, as, a, as a need, and um, the school kindly sends Janet and I um, to reunions around in different places, and we're now starting to give that chat to the, the alumni that we meet from age 19 to 86, not that we taught the 86-year-olds, but, um, <laughs> and, and have, give that message that it is important to give back to the school. So, and, and really, Martha did not put me up, or I'm sure Julie up to say this tonight, but um, it is such a passion of ours to, to give back to the school that has created these young women that are out there in the world doing unbelievable things. And uh, I think it's really important to give back that way. Thank you. And that's why I'm a planned giver. I don't know what you call it, the whatever, but um, it's planned gift. Yes, I have, I'm one of the ones that's participating in the planned giving in my will. Money will come to the school, and I think that's important for me to be able to say that because I think it's um, something that is easy for some of us to be able to do. And very powerful, powerful impact. Yes, thank you. Joanne. Um, I think I'll just uh, focus on one thing that we didn't really touch on uh, today, uh, this evening, that I hear a lot about, and it surprises me when I'm dealing with very affluent people who are very successful in their careers, and they've built businesses, they've had amazing careers, uh, they, they've made a lot of money, and then we move into the philanthropy discussion, and they'll say something like, I don't want any of my donation to go to salaries, or admin, or I'd like uh, I'd like to find the um, organizations with the lowest admin costs um, because I want it really to just go to programming or to a project, et cetera. And unfortunately, a lot of people do have that lens when they're they're trying to see which charities are the best run. And so, just a couple of points on that is that. Um, the best charity is not the charity who has, you know, 100% volunteers and zero admin costs. Um, charitable organizations uh, need to hire good people if they're going to be well run. You do make less in the charitable sector than the for-profit sector, but you still need to pay people well if you're going to attract good people to do the job. Um, if the organization is going to perform well, they're going to need human resources, they're going to need computers, that work. Uh, they don't want to be sitting in offices with paint chipping off of the wall. And, and they're going to have to spend money on marketing to get the word out about the good work that they're doing if they're going to attract um, any kind of funding. So you would never, these same people would never say to a for-profit business that 
you know, you can't spend any money on marketing or, you know, you, you have to keep your salaries as low as possible. Can you go replace people with volunteers? And, you know, computers are too expensive. You wouldn't say that. So putting that type of a standard on a charity in terms of judging them is really problematic. So the conversation needs to be a lot more focused. I mean, the charity needs to act responsibly in terms of how they manage their money. And there's some criteria and some rules. Uh, but the, co the conversation needs to be focused more around uh, the impact of your giving rather than one line on a financial statement in terms of how they're spending or what their expenses are. Bless you for saying that, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Um, I guess my final thought is that sometimes philanthropy or giving can, be, can seem to be a one-way street where we're giving to an organization, but in my experience, it really has worked both ways. In the process of me giving and out of a spirit of abundance, I've received so much in return. Uh, you know, sitting on the board of uh, Canadian Opera Company, the, on that board, there's somebody from McKinsey, there's someone very senior at some of the banks, there's somebody from Four Seasons Hotel. When we have a, a strategic problem to solve, uh, I am privy to all of these different people and how they would approach the problem. And, you know, it's sort of, a, it's like an MBA, uh, but maybe better than an MBA because it sort of opens your eyes again to the limitations of your thinking within your own discipline and how you can sort of approach problems in different ways and solve them in different ways. Uh, so I really think that um, when you think about philanthropy and you think about your future here, really sort of see it as a two-way street where you might be giving, but you'll, be, you'll probably be receiving more in return. Thank you, that's lovely. Yeah. So with that, I'd, I'd like to see if anybody in the audience has questions they'd like to ask of our panelists. And you'll probably have to wave your hand madly because there's a hand waving. Um, so my question uh, is to hear your thoughts around the other roles that women play, um, say, in a corporate environment, because women, I have found, uh, quite often are the they're really the drivers of, of corporate giving. Um, and then the other model that I think is quite interesting is women business owners and how uh, quite often they drive um, you know, social enterprise within their organizations or build their companies around a social purpose or a, 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 there's, a, there's that type of lens to how they, they build that, the, the corporate social responsibility part of their business. So, I guess it's really just looking at the other roles that women play in different parts of the business and philanthropy ecosystem, other than just their own personal giving. Great question. Who would like to uh, take that on? I'll start. Oh, I'll start, actually. The, um, women, um, well, let's talk about women and boards, first of all, because even our research showed that um, the majority of donors are women uh, to charities. The majority of volunteers are, are also women. Um, but the majority for the large charities of board members are still men. And, and when you look at why, I, I will say that um, sometimes, well, first of all, women are often in, in a sandwich generation looking after kids, looking after aging parents. I get that part. But I, I recruit for my own private giving foundation board. And when I, when I recruit um, a man, and we, we did list a job criteria, what, what's involved, it, they will look at that list. And if they can do you know, three things on a list of 10, they're a shoe in. And if the, the woman can do nine out of the 10, she feels she's not qualified to be a board member. And so one thing that women have to do is it's okay to fake it, men do, um, but, but <laughs> it's okay to learn on the job. It's okay to go not knowing everything and ask questions and, and learn on the job also. And, um, and so you know, we need to have more diversity in, in boards and in leadership. Uh, so that it's not necessarily all white men. Um, women are growing in entrepreneurship and they often do have a social lens. So it's everything from where are you uh, getting your supply, what are, who are your suppliers and what are their business practices. A woman will, will definitely take that lens. Women will, will commit um, you know, part of their profits back to charities or will build that whole social purpose 
um, into, their, into their organizations. Women have traditionally had trouble getting financing as they grow their businesses, so I know our organization is trying to develop strategies to help, um, to help women, um, to help give financing. And, and on, the, on the corporate social responsibility, I think that you know all companies, all for-profit companies, are really paying attention to that. Um, they're not. There's a certain percentage of their income that they're ensuring they're giving to charity, but they're also engaging their employees as volunteers. Um, they're coming. They're becoming very strategic in terms of what their pillars are. So it used to be if somebody at the top knew some organization that asked them for money then they would get the check. And that's, you know, just call the CEO and then they'll send it down and say, pay this organization this. I would say that corporations across the board are becoming much, much more strategic um, in terms of what the impact of their giving is and how involved their employees are and, and how involved they are in the community. So that whole corporate social responsibility is, is changing, and I think, for the better. And I can just build on the social enterprise idea, um, the idea that women have, and I, and, and I don't have any data to support it, but um, the question was, have, have women led this trend? Are women more likely to, to use this business, their business for social ends? Um, you know, Zita Cobb is, is sort of, has been on the leading edge of this. Uh, she's, she's way ahead of everybody. Uh, Fogo Island is sort of a, a business, but, but all the profits in the business go back to the community uh, of Fogo Island. Um, and when we interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, you know, we set it within the context of a bigger shift that's happening now within the business world. Uh, and if you've been reading the business uh, section, you would know that, uh, I think it was in August this year, that 180 business leaders from the states, uh, Apple CEO, you know, the CEOs of all the biggest companies, most of the business companies in the states, came together and uh, made a statement that business should not uh, serve shareholders' interests first and foremost to the exclusion of their their uh, communities, their employees, uh, and other stakeholders. So it is um, a shift that we're seeing, and um, you know we're gonna we're gonna have to see if this actual statement plays through in reality and whether they actually live that value. But for the first time, you're seeing CEOs come together and say. Actually, there are multiple, multiple stakeholders here that we, we have a responsibility to, uh, shareholders being one of them, but also our employees, our communities. Does anybody want to add to that? Th those were fulsome answers, so thank you. Another question, yes. yes. Um, my question ties into something that Joanne was just saying. Uh, is there any incentive for a corporation to send or allow their They don't get any tax savings, but um, there are a lot of employee volunteer programs that go on with different corporations. Uh, so, for example, I mean, there's many, and some do, you know, have whole teams that will go volunteer for a day. Um, they may go to Ronald McDonald House and they may be cooking, you know, uh, the evening dinner. And, and it's very common to see uh, teams do that. We will lend, uh, we will second somebody to United Way for six months, 12 months. Um, and that's a very rich experience for an employee. So we're actually paying them their full salary while they're working at United Way for six months. Um, and they will come back, probably a richer, happier, more productive employee. W there might be a program that well, at TD, uh, once you've volunteered 40 hours in a year for a, for uh, a particular organization, then you you can apply to TD for a volunteer grant that they will pay that organization. So, um, it's it's you know we don't want you know employees that are just sitting behind their desk constantly being productive, and um, we know that if employees uh, are are giving back, are working as a team, it's great team building that they're going to come back and be happier, more productive employees. Great, thank you. On the left here. On the left. better 
then gives the government resources to uh, help reduce poverty, to put towards healthcare, education, et cetera. So I'll start with that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I think we're going to be here for about an hour and a half more. Is that okay for everyone? So there I want to do this yeah, debate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there, have been, there have been surveys and questions asked about who is better at solving a particular issue? Is it government or is it charities? And the answer generally comes back as charities. But the way I position it with clients is that if you have any income or you have any wealth in Canada, your tax dollars, which we call your social capital, are going to Ottawa. So you, have, you totally have a choice. You can say, I love what they're doing with my tax dollars and my social capital in Ottawa. I'm totally good. I don't need to do this. But many of the people that I talk to, uh, when they start commenting on how some of the money is being spent in Ottawa, would say, I'd really like to take some of that social capital back and allocate it to things that are important to me, that are my values, that aren't necessarily the same ones uh, as our current government. And so that's my, my say. That's super. Um, there's a great um, podcast recently by The Economist um, on exactly this topic, and there was a, I, can't, I cannot remember the name of the author nor the name of the book, so I apologize. Um, but he does refer, the author in, in the podcast um, does refer to this exact question, and he also asked the question, would... Uh, Mark Zuckerberg have been let to go as far as the whole drama uh, around Brexit if he hadn't had such a huge moral glow attached to him due to his great um, philanthropy. And I think that's a very worthwhile question to, to explore. I don't know if governments are better placed. They certainly have, um, they, they have greater reach in terms of what they see, but you know it's clear that the the um, that charities have are far more focused. Um, so I, I think it's a philosophical question, and, and I'm I'm certainly I can't answer it. Um, I can just say what my philosophy is. Um. Trump. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's, that's an answer to how you want your government spending your money. Um, and I would think about some of the charities that these women are involved with and whether our government would support Crow's Theatre, what our government can do in the space of a few years with our libraries, with our education system, with our health care. Um, and I think there is a very, very important role. I know I'm not supposed to be answering the questions, but never mind. Um, for the individual in supporting what they believe. We've talked about values in action, and I think, I mean, I think it's a brilliant question uh, and a very important one. And I think, you know, Janice Meehan thought up this whole event. I think this might be another event, a debate about the, the value of philanthropy in society. Uh, obviously, I believe strongly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting where we'd be if our government, uh, which is only there for a short period of time, uh, were to be directing those funds. Jill, you, you say Trump. How about Doug Ford? Absolutely. Uh, no, seriously. I'm yeah. on the board of the Royal Ontario Museum, and you know, I would be frightened to tell you what he thought was an appropriate amount of money to, to give to the ROM um, this year, and, but there was a lot of pushback. But the truth of the matter is, the ROM, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the jewels of the, in the crown of Ontario, if not all of Canada. It's, it's just an amazing museum and has some of the best collections. It has the second largest mineral collection, I happen to be. <laughs> being a mineral girl. Just being in the whole mining part, so I'm a little. But the reality is, the ROM needs, needs funding and has a huge base of donors. And thank goodness, I mean, we're so blessed. And St. Clements is so blessed to be so close and to have the girls have their annual trip there. It's, it's, um, it's just an amazing resource. And that's why I'm on the board. You can tell I'm a little yeah. passionate about it. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to... Are there any other questions? No, I'd like to say a word about St. Clements as well. Um, some of the people in this room are people I've met through fundraising and through my work. But some of them are people I went to school with, should I say how long ago? <laughs> no. 
Um, friendships that last a lifetime, um, a spirit of inquiry, uh, support, and um, my daughter is here too, who I'm very proud of. Uh, and I honestly believe that she wouldn't be who she is without you know, the, the kind of character and, and education that I had here. Um, and so it was so great to hear from these amazing women, uh, many of whom are a product of St. Clement's, uh, or who have influenced that product. And uh, so it's been very special to be here today and to hear your thoughts and to share this with this audience. And with that, I think I hand over the mic. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Martha Perry and I'm the principal here at St. Clement's, a very proud principal, an alumna as well, and, uh, and also a legacy donor. I will also be leaving money to St. Clement's in my will. I am, but I'm sticking around, um, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, what a sense of pride this evening. First of all, Janice, for the brainchild of having this, Michelle Kim for arranging all of this, and to have all of you. Joanne, I know you're not a Clementine, but it's certainly amazing to have you here with your wealth of knowledge and doing the important research that we need. And then to have our community of Clementines and Clementine, um, I would say creators, um, which is fairly ominous, but it's quite true with Wendy, um, I would say. Um, this is just such a privilege for me to sit and, and hear this, also to know how important philanthropy is to all of us, um, for young and old, and um, but most importantly to see the remarkable women who are a result of St. Clement's and what you're doing in the world. This to me is what every one of our girls should be seeing all the time. So I'm so deeply um, grateful to all of you for being a part of this, and we have a small token of appreciation, and I just want to thank you again so much. So I will give you.